Um, a little bit about your sound. How do you describe the music you make? Well, I think if there's one thing I could be defined by, it would probably be diversity and bass. You know, I, I really, you know, I've made all different kinds of music, house music, break beats, drum and bass, hip hop, dubstep, all over the place, you know, and it really, whenever I'm in the studio and I'm writing, I'm always trying to do something that I've never done before. And then that way, it's always a fresh challenge for me in the studio and it keeps things moving. And I find that, um, you know, there's a lot of pressure in the industry when you find uh, a hit record to just turn that into a formula and beat it to death again and again and again. But, you know, that, that will get you somewhere in the short term because you become a predictable quantity. But at the same time, you know, when you watch an artist just repeat themselves again and again and again, eventually it all becomes kind of meaningless and uh, the emotion goes and then you end up getting sick of the formula and then you end up getting sick of that song that made you like that artist in the first place. And really, you know, I'm, I'm in it for the long haul. Uh, I'm not, you know, I'm not there to, to just make a couple hit records, grab some cash and then go get a day job, you know, like I'm, I'm, I'm a lifer. So it's really important to me to be able to have a sustainable kind of constantly evolving creative presence. And, uh, you know, that's really, that's what I'm all about. So, I mean, bass is something that I absolutely love and it's, you know, the physical nature of it, it just, it just, you don't really get a choice whether you enjoy it or not, you know, when the, when you're in front of like a giant PK sound system and, you know, those oscillators are all moving around inside your organs and rattling your teeth and stuff. It's just, it's spectacular, you know, and it's, uh, it's, it's body music, you know, so I like to make, make brain music for your body, really. Uh, so who influenced you? All kinds of people. I mean, when I was first coming up, uh, I was really into really like abstract, experimental, electronic music. You know, bands like like Throbbing Gristle and Skinny Puppy and Download and Aphex Twin and all that. But at the same time, I always had a very, very deep love of hip hop and funk and, uh, you know, I really at that point, there wasn't really anywhere where it would meet in the middle. So I was in, uh, I was in like a breakdance crew. I was the DJ for a breakdance crew, and they were all freaks, you know. Like we'd show up at the at the b-boy jams, and like everybody would be wearing like tutus and face paint, and like animal heads and stuff. And all the other b-boys would be really upset because they would all, you know, have their their baseball hat sideways and their Adidas jacket like right out of the b-boy textbook. And my crew would always beat them, and they would get really annoyed being beaten by all these freaks and dresses uh, and uh, you know I would play hip-hop records and, and breakdance records but then also use like you know experimental noise records to scratch with and stuff and be really like um, you know just kind of change it up all the time but it's really like fusing those two sounds as a DJ was cool but I was you know really trying to fuse a style that was experimental and electronic and heady, but also funky and hip hop and bassy. And just over the years, uh, I kind of evolved into the sound that I have now. And lucky for me, the rest of the world kind of gets it now. And uh, you know, I don't have to wait until six in the morning for all the house music to be done to, to play anymore. You know, so it's really, uh, uh, yeah, I'm really kind of lucky that I that I had the right vision because. When I was first starting out, I pretty much thought that, you know, I was just going to make weird music that nobody liked forever, and I was okay with that, but uh, it really kind of caught on and took off, and especially with the rise of, like, dubstep and bass music, uh, it really kind of opened things up, and now things are great. It feels so good, that's why this fluff flies fast, unlike the horse that came and lost, the one that pops better, having a flutter on the GG, see me, I just BB, like it. Uh, let's talk about your performance setup a little bit. All right, well, uh, I have a lot of different kinds of performance setups, um, and 
I kind of tailor them to what exactly it is that I'm going to be doing at any particular show. Uh, for the, I'm doing a driving tour in the fall, and in that setup, it's all like really nice custom controllers that were built by a guy named Moldover uh, in San Francisco. They're all like arcade buttons and touch strips and stuff. And then I got like a. LED laptop stand that I can uh, put images on and stuff that uh, that's like concert brightness that holds a laptop uh, and then video and everything. Uh, but when I'm flying, doing fly dates, it's mostly just you know one backpack. Try to have the smallest possible footprint, get the most capacities out of my controllers that I can. I mix with a DJ mixer just to uh, to create redundancy so that if anything happens to my controller, I can still work on the mixer or if anything happens to the mixer, I can just plug directly into my sound card. Uh, and I just, you know, I come from a DJ background, so, you know, it really makes sense for me to use a mixer. And I feel like a lot of the time when you're doing um, Ableton sets, when like people, you can be doing anything back there, you know, and a lot of the time people don't really understand it and they think maybe you're just like hitting play and kind of faking the funk or whatever, but everybody understands a DJ mixer. When people see you working with a DJ mixer, it kind of invites them in and lets them know what's going on because, I mean, the back of a laptop can be like the Berlin Wall between you and the crowd sometimes, you know, like it's, and I like people to, to understand what I'm doing and I like them to, you know, to feel like they they're invited in to, to what's going on, understand the performance. Uh, so today I'm going to be using a controller called the Live It Ohm. Uh, actually, here, I'll go get it. Yeah, so this is a Live It Ohm RGB Slim. Uh, it's made by a company called Live It Instruments in Texas. They were nice enough to do me a, a custom version here. Uh, and it's, it's all metal, very, very tightly quality controlled, excellent, excellent parts. Uh, and it really offers me all the capabilities that I need to be able to do everything that I want. Um, you can control the buttons to make punch-in effects, uh, which is very, very important. In Ableton, it's actually quite difficult to make effects where they're on when you hold the button down and off when you let go of the button. Normally, you have to go on and then off. Uh, this is a really controllable or a really programmable controller, so you can have, have them send what's known as like control change messages instead of note on and off. So, you can do punch-ins, uh, punch-in or momentary effects. Uh, and then these are all like APC style RGB buttons here and they have like seven different colors. And uh, I was able to make like VU meters on them that, uh, that light up so I can see where the volumes are at all the time. Uh, and then, you know, punch-in effects and clip triggers. And, you know, the knobs and sliders and everything are great. And really it's, uh, you know, it's everything that I, that I need in a controller for the most part. And it's small enough to fit in a backpack. The one that I'm gonna be using on the driving tour uh, is a, it's what's called a Mojo. Uh, there's only 10 of them in the world and it's made by a guy named Moldover. But it's like a cash register covered in arcade buttons and touch strips and stuff. And it's really, you know, when you fly with it, they keep trying to get me to check my bag because it's just too too big and uh, it's hard to avoid the faders and knobs getting damaged and stuff when you stuff in the bag. Whereas these things are really like road ready, durable, uh, they're tough. Uh, and you know the Livid guys gave me a bunch of extra fader tips and stuff in case I in case I lose any. So yeah, this is this is my go-to. Uh, and then I use an iPad to trigger sound effects and lasers and such. Um, and it's also really a good idea to have a backup kind of source of audio in case uh, God forbid anything should happen to your computer. Um, I'll have like you know a few tracks in the iPad that I can just switch over from the soundboard trigger mode to drop a track and reboot the computer. I haven't had to use that yet, but you never know. I mean, generally the bigger you get, the more likely it is that someone's gonna throw something at the stage. And, you know, I've seen drinks get poured into laptops. I've seen lights fall over on laptops. I've seen yeah. speakers fall over on laptops. So, I mean, even if, you, even if your software and operating system and everything are running fine, you never know, right? So, I mean, you know, anyone can get up on a stage and press play and dance around. It's really your ability to, to foresee and stave off all of the potential problems that inevitably happen in a performance in a kind of calm, professional manner without letting the audience know that anything's wrong. That's really what makes a, makes a professional because 
nine times out of ten there's something that's less than optimal about the setup and you know if you get bent out of shape about that and storm off stage that's the story that people go home with and you know really like i said before it's all about creating a conversation and tightly tightly controlling what the experience that people go home with is and what the story that they tell is so you got to be prepared for all eventualities and have like a, a rock solid setup that is just you know always gonna work for you so yeah this thing the ipad dj mixer and uh sound card is, is the way i do it and you're still running ableton oh yeah yeah, I, I would brush my teeth with Ableton if I could. I'd dream in little colored boxes. I mean, it's it's the jam. So the, uh, that brings me to my next question is your Ableton templates. Uh, for guys that are scoping those out or wondering if they should be using them, what makes them ideal um, as a DJ setup? Well, most people, because the thing is when Ableton, when you just get Ableton, you open it up, and it's empty. You got one audio track and one MIDI track and you have to program everything, right? Mm -hmm. And most people will just load in, you know, eight tracks worth of warped clips and have like maybe a volume fader for each of them and just play like three or four tracks at once and be like, oh, hey, you know, Derek May's got nothing on me, you know, look how fast I can select colored boxes, woo. You know, but uh, it just ends up coming out a muddy mess and really, you know, programming the effects that you have, a very, very detailed level of control uh, where you can have like, uh, I mean, one thing that I like to do is, it's inspired by the Pioneer DJM series of mixers where you have uh, one knob that selects up to five effects and another knob that will engage and tweak the effects. So you can have like five effects uh, with two knobs, right? It's a really kind of smart way to do it. Uh, and then, you know, uh, I like to program my, my volume faders so that they do, the, they do an EQ curve as well with the filters because when you think about mixing, right, typically you're introducing the mid-range first and then only the very top and the bottom as that track takes dominance. So it makes it so you can have much, much smoother, smoother mixes if you're doing volume and EQ with the fader and, uh, you know, it really adds a lot of richness that you can't, you can't do in a DJ mixer. Uh, and you know, then I have a system of warping and track preparation that I call making clip packs uh, that has proven to be very popular. Uh, and that this templates are, you know, they're they're battle ready, tested by guys like DJ Vadim, Bass Nectar, Pretty Lights, Beats Antique. Like those guys are all running my templates. And you know, if it's good enough for them, then you know it gets the job done. Uh, but yeah, and then I have them for all different kinds of controllers. You can uh, you can check it out on my YouTube channel, uh, youtube.com slash illgatesmusic. Uh, there's demos of a lot of them, and even if you don't want to buy one, uh, you can get an explanation of the kind of philosophies behind it and kind of reverse engineer uh, the templates. And then I have studio templates and stuff too. But yeah, it's, it's really funny. I mean, I never thought that I would really get into that. I've always been a musician, first and foremost. but. One day I was over on the Ableton board and someone posted an ultimate DJ template, which was really laughable. So, uh, you know, be being a kind of facetious jerk sometimes, I started making fun of them and they were like, well, hey, you know, what do you got going on? And I explained my template and they were like, well, can I buy one? And I was like, you know what? Yeah, yeah, you can. And then uh, then I, I started to selling templates and, you know, I was the first person to start doing that. And then. You know, other people have come on and started programming templates too. We're actually, uh, we're actually working on making like a central hub for everybody who does it, where users can upload their own templates and sell them, and samples and tutorials and all that stuff. Uh, but you know, it's a lot of a lot of web development time, and I can't let that get in the way of my music. So that proceeds at a much slower pace than like my releases and touring and stuff. But you know, I feel it's something that the community needs, and you know, I've always been really open to sharing what I do. Uh, and helping other people do that too because it's just you know I want to see things move forwards and I want to see things that you know we all thought were impossible being done with ease you know just to, to keep the music evolving keep it going forwards and just make it better and better and better in the future uh, so what's next for you uh, well there's that driving tour that I mentioned where we're doing uh, we're doing a routed I think it's like 
40 or 50 dates uh, in November and December. And yeah, we're gonna be driving all around Canada and the US. I'm bringing a PK sound system, I'm bringing visuals. Um, Stefan Jacobs and this guy Jay Fay uh, are gonna be opening. And Jay Fay's this awesome like Moubaton trap guy. And then uh, Stefan Jacobs is from Headtron. He has like the kind of classic psychedelic West Coast glitchy hip hop dubstep sound. Uh, so those two will be opening. Uh, and then, yeah, we got video and sound. And yeah, it's gonna be really fun. It's called the uh, the Church of Bass Tour, because uh, a lot of people don't realize this, but I'm actually a uh, legally ordained reverend, and uh, I believe that uh, music is a sacrament, and it has healing powers, and uh, I'm trying to travel uh, around North America, spreading the message, and getting people to sign up listing bass uh, as their religion, uh, and then we're going to see if we can get it to have, you know, full full, you know, non-profit, like, tax-exempt status in the U.S. and, like, legitimize it as a, as a religion. So, uh, it's a bit of a, you know, it's gonna be, it's gonna be a bit of a challenge, but, uh, you know, I feel that music does really serve a uh, religious purpose in a lot of people's lives, and, uh, you know, it's something that provides meaning and structure and you know, community to people, and, you uh, really helps helps bring them together and live a good life and inspires them to be creative and I mean really you know that's uh, those are all very religious functions you know and I think it's really time that people people respected music as a, as a religion so yeah so it's a church based tour should be pretty fun